So I'm going to introduce our first speaker who for most people um, will need very little um, introduction, uh, uh, Richard Porter. Um, Richard um, has been involved with OSME from the outset when OSME was uh, formed back in 1968 as the Ornithological Society of Turkey. Um, he's remained involved in um, all activities of, of OSME uh, including uh, now he does loads of guest blogs uh, for OSME and he sits on our conservation fund um, committee. Um, Richard uh, has been involved in the birds of the Middle East since uh, the 1960s when he was doing raptor monitoring in Turkey uh, which led to the first uh, field guide flight identification of European raptors. Uh, he has uh, written with um, the late and great Simon Aspinall uh, field guide to the birds of the Middle East, uh, on which uh, other field guides for Cyprus, the UAE and Oman are based. Um, and that book has recently been translated uh, into Arabic uh, by BirdLife International and um, OSMI and is freely available as a downloadable app. In 2018, Richard was um, awarded an Honorary Life Fellow uh, of, uh, of OSMI, uh, our second Honorary Life Fellow. He's worked extensively in the Middle East, um, especially in Iraq and Yemen, uh, and I'm delighted that he's um, agreed to provide us with some insights to one of probably the most special places in the Osmi region, uh, the islands of Socotra. So over to you, Richard, for your talk on Socotra um, updates from an Arabian jewel. Thank you very much indeed, Rob. Can everybody hear me? Yes, you can. Okay, I'm going to go straight on to my presentation about this wonderful island uh, of Socotra. I've been to Socotra many times um, from 1993 up until the early part of this decade when things became rather difficult um, to travel there. Not impossible, but difficult. Um, but I've made some wonderful friends and I hope some of them were able to uh, join us today because uh, uh, connections with the island are, are difficult, particularly at the moment. But if they are here, then welcome um, to your special island. Now, just a brief history. This is a typical Rich, view. Richard, uh, could you just uh, share your screen at this point? Uh, sorry. No problems. Um, yeah, okay, now I've got to go back and do something here. Toolbar at the bottom, the, the yeah, end. The, 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 the tool, I think I'm going to have to end the show and the toolbar share screen, okay? And then that blue button down the bottom when you're, ah, perfect, thank you. Okay, go back to the beginning, yep. Slideshow, right. So can you see that now? Yep. That's great, Richard. Thanks. Okay, no, sorry about that. Um, so this is the Socotra sunbird, one of the special birds of the island, introducing you to this Socotra update. Um, a brief history. This is a typical view of the, uh, the Hagia Mountains, the high point of Socotra with the dragon blood tree in front. And Socotra sits out in the Arabian Sea, some 300 kilometers south of Yemen. It's a, a Yemen island and it's remote. It's 100 by 300 kilometers in size. It has four other small islands, the most important of one, one of which is, the, is Abdul Kudi. The highest peak goes up to 1,500 meters, a population of over 40,000 and the, the very strong winds in the summer monsoons uh, can get up to 100 miles, 100 kilometers an hour. Typical view up in Scand with the, the peaks of the Hagia Mountains in the background, wonderful mixed mosaic of, of, of trees and shrubs. And then down onto the coast with the coastal plains, uh, often dominated by Sueda and in places some very high cliffs. This is the most complicated slide you're going to see today, but it is very important. 
We've got 12 endemic breeding birds. That includes the breeding um, Juanin's petrel, which is more widespread, but it's only known to breed on Socotra. It's got the highest world concentration of endangered Egyptian vultures, um, nearly 2,000 individuals. 21 important bird and biodiversity areas have been identified. And the next one, the, 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 the penultimate one, I think is really important. It's got the, the number of endemic birds is higher than that of any country in the Middle East, Europe, North Africa, and Central Asia. So that sort of gives you a, a pretty good snapshot of its importance. And it's designated an endemic bird area by BirdLife International and is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Plants, because it's very important for its plant diversity, 850 species, 307 of them are endemics and all given a high conservation status by IUCN. And this is one of the specialities, the uh, cucumber tree. Frankincense, another important tree, 25 species in the world, eight on Socotra. The Socotra chameleon is the only endemic reptile. But the Egyptian vulture, as I mentioned earlier, the highest world concentration, probably about 800 breeding pairs. Now, the bird surveys that were carried out with OSMI support and BirdLife International support between 1999 and 2011 found 44 species bred and five probably bred. A breeding atlas was compiled, published in Sandgrouse, and over 380 kilometers of transects carried out to assess the breeding bird populations. So from that, for example, we were able to calculate that about 3,800 individuals of one of the rare birds, the Socotra bunting. And again, with all these breeding birds, an atlas was prepared in this case for the Socotra bunting. Here we can see with the large dots, proven breeding, probable breeding on the small dots. Um, that's probably got one of the most impoverished distributions of all the uh, endemic birds, apart from the Abdul Karim sparrow, because most of them, fortunately, are widespread and relatively common. Now, a few other facts. The Juanin's petrel are globally near threatened, common around the seas of southern Arabia and beyond, but only found breeding on Socotra for the first time in the world in 2000. And there is the, uh, the adult Juanin's petrel with the only egg that's ever been photographed in the wild. And that was discovered when we were out there in, in 2000, but the actual climb to the nest was done by um, Nadim Talib and Ahmed Said Suleiman. House crows arrived in 1994, started breeding, getting up to about 15 pairs, and finally, after very many attempts, were eradicated in 2009. So that was a, a conservation success because that could have been quite a problem for, um, um, for the breeding birds of the island. And then the Socotra buzzard, which had remained for the previous hundred or more years of just buzzard spur, was finally named in 2010 as Socotra buzzard, Butio socotraensis, and a year later went into the Guinness Book of Records as the, um, the latest bird of prey in the world. The surveys that were carried out um, also helped to identify and re-identify, in some cases, the important bird areas um, of, uh, of Socotra, the IBAs. And here is a map showing them on the mainland, the island, main island of Socotra. And also, we must remember that the islands offshore of uh, Subina, Samha, Darsa, Kalifarun, which is just a, literally a rock, and Abdulkuri, are also important bird areas, particularly for their seabirds. 
And all that information fed into a plan that was being developed under, under Yemeni guidance, particularly by the, the, um, the, uh, the um, Yemen Authority on Conservation. And this conservation zoning plan was prepared. Um, very briefly, the red areas <clears throat> are identified as nature sanctuaries, the dapper ones, botanically important, and the blue ones are national parks. So a good proportion of Socotra has at least on paper been designated uh, of being important for conservation. And in 2008, Socotra became a World Heritage Site. And in that same year, it also joined the Ramsar Convention. And indeed, Socotra's first um, uh, main wetland, the Ditwa Lagoon, um, was designated as Yemen's first Ramsar site. So that's the background. But going forward in the last 10 years, much of the work has been dominated um, by the United Nations Global Environment Facility Conservation uh, and Sustainable Development Programme. This has been supported by BirdLife and also by OSME. And now I just want to tell you fairly briefly about some of the main activities that had happened under that. And I'm just going to talk about mangrove replanting, the replanting of frankincense and dragon blood trees, vulture awareness, wildlife lessons for schools, red data review, and the World Heritage Site status review. Now, in 2015, there was a really serious hurricane which destroyed a number of parts of Socotra, um, vegetation wise. And as a result of that, one of the projects under the UNEP um, Jeff program was to start two community mangrove nurseries and the idea is to grow these mangroves and then replant them in areas which have become devastated. So that's important because there's a number of really interesting species um, nesting in these mangroves um, and of course mangroves are very very important as a buffer against um, hurricanes and tsunamis and events of that nature. Overgrazing has been a major problem on Socotra for many years. And this was made worse, um, the, the, the devastation of, of uh, vegetation, by the uprooting of dragon blood trees and other vegetation during the, the, this hurricane. And again, as a result, under the UNE Jeff program, nurseries for replanting. Um, frankincense and dragon blood trees were started. These are community nurseries, so there's a complete buy-in by the people of Socotra. And here we see one of the uh, a frankincense tree, not in a nursery, but in its uh, typical setting on Socotra. And celebrating International Vulture Awareness Day, which is carried out throughout the world in September, the Socotrans joined in 2018 and supported financially by OSME. Um, for the last two years, there's been an International Vulture Awareness Day event. And this year, it's going to be shared also with BirdLife. Um, and hopefully, the United Nations Global Environments for Facilities Programme um, to have a, another extended series of events celebrating this very important bird on Socotra and also the other wildlife. And as you'll see, OSME prominently um, displayed there on the, on the banner of the um, 2018 event, um, which again had really good buy-in from all the relevant organizations uh, to support this program. And this gave advice to, on the use of poisons and animal drugs, such as diclofenac, and there were a series of events extolling the virtues of the vulture, the problems it's facing globally, the problems it could face on Socotra, including the misuse of poisons, which fortunately has, hasn't been an issue. Driver awareness was another thing because with the new roads being built and the speed at which uh, uh, drivers go, 
many vultures coming down to feed on animals that have been perhaps killed by, by speeding cars um, also get hit. So again, that was part of the part of the program. But more importantly, it was to raise the awareness um, of the importance of this bird in the community. And there were painting competitions, this delightful one with, um, with the vulture on the right and a series of, of, of lovely images depicting all sorts of things from the misuse of plastics um, to, uh, to, to the beauty of the culture itself. And these were all rewarded by, um, by certificates which handed out to children, young people that took part in these awareness events. But it wasn't just awareness for vultures, it was also to try and engage the community in, for example, plastic awareness. It was becoming a, a buzzword um, around the world and the Zocotrans quickly picked up on this. And so during their events to celebrate vultures, birds of prey and uh, other wildlife, there were big collections of, of plastics and other rubbish from the beaches uh, of Socotra. And here's another image of children and adults collecting and um, rubbish, plastics, um, on their Vulture Awareness Events Week. During the program, 20 environmental lessons for school children were, um, were developed. And this is one, lesson six on bird migration under the uh, United Nations Jeff Socotra Conservation and Sustainable Development Project. And it was interesting that this was the one that the children particularly wanted more lectures on. Bird migration was one of the things they found most fascinating. And so we did an, a second lesson for them. And these lessons were all delivered by, um, by teachers in Socotri, uh, in the Socotri language to both adults and children. And hopefully more will be developed because uh, they really were uh, very popular. Their first insight in, 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 in terms of, um, of lessons um, into an understanding of their environment, the wildlife and the threats to that wildlife. One of the other um, activities was a, a red data review of Socotra's four threatened and near threatened species. Here is the Socotra bunting, but it also included the Abdul um, Kuri sparrow, and the Socotra cysticola. And the interesting thing there was what came out of this review. We found that, for example, the devastation um, to the, uh, the habitat was probably the major threat to the bunting, but it wasn't as, as high as it was to the Socotra cysticola, which nests in the, the plains, uh, the low plains, particularly the coastal plains, where coastal development really was impacting on its, uh, uh, on its habitat. In the case of the Abdul Kuri sparrow, there was also concern uh, about the number of being trapped um, for food. And so a variety of, 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 um, of issues covering this uh, review of the red data species. And then the UNESCO World Heritage Site status is up for review. And we undertook this earlier this year. This is a scene at the bottom there of a dragon's blood tree forest, wonderful forest. Um, and the publication of this status review will probably be taking place uh, over the, um, the latter part of the year. Socotra white eye was the latest endemic species, not yet accepted by BirdLife International, but by a number of other authorities. Uh, work on its morphology and particularly its um, DNA has shown it to be a new species. So this is the 11th true species, uh, 11th bird that's a, a species, uh, an endemic species for Socotra. Um, and add to that 11 the, uh, the uh, Juanin's petrel, which um, breeds on Socotra but is far more widespread. Um, outside the breeding season. White-faced whistling ducks, my good friend Ahmed Said Suleiman discovered 
a flock of 12 in January, new for the Middle East. And I just wanted to acknowledge the work that he's done because he's been a, a close working colleague over many, many years. And then just finally to finish, <clears throat> I wanted to mention a, a little story which has been published in, 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 uh, on the OSME website as a, as a guest blog. Um, there's been a program in Mongolia to ring common cuckoos, tag them with satellite tags and follow their migration. And this particular bird, Namje, flew right the way across the island of Socotra, which you can see there, the, the, the purple line going across Socotra, where it probably stopped and then carried on down to the winter in Africa. Now, what an incredible journey that is from Mongolia, right the way across India, across the Arabian Sea or across Arabia, down into, I mean, you can see why the kids on Socotra were fascinated by migration stories. And so were the children in Mongolia. And they wrote letters, several letters, to the school children on Socotra. You won't be able to read that, but just take a second or two to, to read this from the little village of Binda in Mongolia. How are you? My name is Namingu. We are delighted to know that Namja, the cuckoo, flew over your special island in the Arabian Sea. It's just amazing to imagine how these little birds went that far. As you may know, those birds get caught in Mongolia, where we live, and fitted with a satellite tag so we could track their long migration. We look forward to seeing these cuckoos back in Mongolia. We send you our good wishes. And to which the Socotran children replied. To our friends at Binda and the Kruk village schools, my name is Afraf Said. I'm studying in the second year at Khalid Ibn University, uh, sorry, Al Wahid High School. Thank you for writing to us. We are also amazed by the small bird Namja for traveling such long distances. We hope Namja will return safely and fly over Socotra on his way back home to Mongolia. I wish you could manage to visit Socotra one day and see its rare birds and plants. Below is one of the interesting birds, Egyptian vulture, called locally Su Hayadu. And so with that, I hope I've just given you an insight into some of the exciting things that have been happening on the remote island of Socotra, even during the difficult times of conflict in, in, in the dear country of Yemen. And I just hope that uh, in future, the, the people of, of Southern Arabia, the people of Yemen, the people of Socotra can look forward to a, a much brighter future. And in finishing, I would like to acknowledge the the UNEP GEF program, OSME for the support it's given, the Environmental Protection Authority of Yemen, and BirdLife Saving Extinctions program. So thank you. That was fantastic, Richard. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I don't know if you can see, but there are lots of uh, applause coming in from around the world. Um, I'm going, to, I'm going to stop sharing your, your screen there now and give people the opportunity to uh, ask questions. There's already one or two in fact from, uh, from Doug Radford. First of all, he asks, why such a high density of Egyptian vultures on Socotra and do they forage away from the island, Richard? Hello, can you hear me, Doug? Hi there. Um, no, they don't. They are they are totally resident. They they don't forage away from Socotra. They're not even on any of the other islands. Um, the reason why they're so, I think there's several reasons. First of all, um, you've got a community that that traditionally um, has big feasts to celebrate weddings and other anniversaries, and the food that, that's left over from that, whether it's a couple of cows or sheep or goats left out and the vultures feed on those. There's also now a tradition of putting out any unwanted food after a meal during the day 
on the top of, of, of a wall of the house and the vultures come down. So they're incredibly tame. And the third thing is that um, no, there's no poisons used uh, on the island um, because there's no dogs. And what happens if you know when you get dogs, at rubbish tips and things like that, one of the things is um, um, wolves and foxes and that, let's get rid of them. But there's no, there's no native mammals on Socotra apart from bats. There's no, dogs are not allowed. And um, so there's no dogs. And so there isn't that problem that you get in so many other places as well. And I think the other thing is that, that there's a natural affinity to the, to the, to the vulture. Um, um, I wrote a little uh, paper in Sandgrouse um, about the ethno-ornithology of the vulture. And in that, um, I collected a lot of poems and things from, uh, and they're wonderful poems and stories about the vulture in, in, uh, in, in, in Socotra culture and mythology. And that in turn, you know, brings about a sort of a, a love and respect for it. So there's a variety of reasons there. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Richard. Thank you, Richard. Um, various other people had, had similar questions. Um, so thank you for answering those. Lots of very positive feedback coming in about the talk. Thanks, Richard, particularly about those wonderful stories uh, from the children communicating about the cuckoo. And then a, a question about the cuckoo, which is, um, prior to the satellite tagging work, um, where previously was it believed that cuckoo were migrating from uh, when they left Socotra or when they were going through Socotra, did, was, were there any thoughts on that? No, I don't think so. I'm not the right person to, to answer that. And I don't know that the, the team that did all the, the work on this, um, spearheaded by um, uh, Birding Beijing and supported by the British Trust for Ornithology, um, they put the, the uh, they tagged the cuckoos in Mongolia. And when they tagged them, they didn't really know they were, where they were going to go. And so it was a kind of revelation that these birds were going um, sort of counterintuitively. You'd have thought they'd have gone south down to Southeast uh, Asia, but it didn't. They came right the way across to winter in Africa. Uh, and um, so nobody knew. So this was a real, real discovery. Brilliant, thank you. Um, Gillian Oscar in the UAE, um, say it looks like Socotra has escaped relatively lightly uh, the current mainland problems is this more or less correct Richard? I think I think more or less correct and I, and I certainly don't want to discuss politics now because it wouldn't be fair in a talk like this but um, I just simply like to say yes and uh, let's hope it remains that way. Um, and a, a, a wider environmental question, how much are rising sea levels a threat to human and wildlife on Socotra, please? Um, I don't think they, I don't think they are. What is um, a, a threat appears to be the increase in the, the number of, of hurricanes um, that are coming in from the southwest appear to be because there was a very serious one in 2015 and there's been others but um, you've got to remember that Socotra has always had this, this, this very interesting climate, this very interesting weather patterns so it's, it's kind of got used to being bashed by monsoons from dry monsoons from May through to September and what amazes me is that I mean, with these winds of up to, I mentioned 100 kilometers an hour, much more than that at times, the wildlife still exists and um, has um, adapted to, to those conditions. And the Socotans are very resilient people, and I don't see, not in, um, in the foreseeable future, rising sea levels being a major threat. Others may, may have a better insight, but that's my uh, quick off the, off the cup thought on that point. Thank you, Richard. I think we're um, up to date on all the questions. Oh, uh, James asks, uh, looks amazing. How difficult uh, is it to visit in, uh, at the current time? Well, I think it is difficult to visit. Um, um, 
there was uh, one, uh, one German who I think has joined us today, Ralph Messing, who went across for a, a week or so uh, in um, February, March time. And, um, but it, it, since then it's got, it's got more difficult. And um, I don't know if there's any of our Socotran friends have been able to join us with, with internet uh, problems that they're having. They'd be best to answer. But uh, of course, you know, once you're there, you've got to get off. And if the situation changes through anything, political problems, COVID problems, then you could be stuck for a long time, but a nice place to get stuck. Great, thank you. Um, Rob, I'll hand back to you at this point. Many thanks indeed, Richard. Pleasure. That's great. Thanks, Nick, for um, sorting, um, sorting those questions out. Thanks everyone for asking the questions, they were very good. And a huge thank you to Richard for a fantastic overview of um, Sutra. I think the, um, the Mongolian cuckoo story and how it links different countries and different cultures across a flyaway is quite, um, quite an inspiration. So uh, thanks. I think that's gone down very well uh, according to the, the chat group as well. So thanks, Richard. That was a, a fantastic um, um, start to the, uh, the meeting.